<laughs> so, good evening. I think we're going to get started. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm Diane Sayre, one of the directors of the Schiller Institute New York City Chorus, and uh, John Seegerson is about to come in, who's another director. And as pe people may or may not know, maestro Tony Morse, who was the conductor of Verissimo Opera for I don't know how long, uh, but what happened was some of our singers were doing, were making the practice recordings for the Beethoven Mass that are up on the website, and then it turned out that he had so many wonderful insights to share with us about the history of the Mass that we thought it would be very valuable for the chorus and anyone else to take advantage of his knowledge on this. So that is why we are going to be hearing from Maestro Morse. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> Dear Schiller Institute friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I will speak about the Mass later on, and especially certain vital topics that will be of considerable interest to you. But my announced topic is folklore and historical truth in biblical times. This presentation developed from a recording session in my apartment and one that discussed added information about the life of Christ from fringe sources. You don't have to be a practicing Christian to think that Christ lived the most powerfully influential and important life that anyone ever did on earth. There's a lot of information about him, but also many gaps in that information so that we would be eager to learn a lot more about him than the four Gospels of the New Testament tell us. How much more is there? You'd be quite surprised to find that out as you're about to. For openers, there are several more Gospels than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is the Gospel of Thomas, which is coming to be widely known, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Judas, <laughs> and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, um, double exclamation point on that one, because this last says that Mary Magdalene was never the prostitute that St. Jerome mistakenly thought she was, and that she was one of Jesus' most spiritually advanced disciples, and the one personally closest to him, which provoked real jealousy from several of the other disciples, notably Peter. The book doesn't go nearly as far as Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, uh, uh, positing that Jesus and Mary were married and had children. But there are some grounds to think that Mary is more important than the official record allows, and that any woman's closeness to Jesus, Jesus would be fiercely resented by the patriarchal prejudice in Jewish society of the time. And yes, she and his followers did eventually settle in Marseille. These Gospels were all written, these Gnostic Gospels, long after the fact, and sometimes a hundred years later, and not by the authors to whom they are attributed. They're often called the Gnostic Gospels because they purport to have secret knowledge, gnosis in Greek, that others don't have. They do make interesting readings, and they are part of a voluminous literature called the Apocrypha, Apocrypha because it is not accepted by the church as divinely inspired and or theologically sound. There is at least one other revelation than St. John's revelation and a great many letters of pastoral advice and exhortation similar to the letters of St. Paul, St. Peter, St. James, and St. John in the New Testament. Many of these are good sound religious thinking but just didn't survive the winnowing process which by the fourth century had at long last settled on agreed upon canons of scripture. It took quite a while. The familiar gospels are fascinating on their own terms. They're all in Greek, which was the language understood by everybody in the Eastern Mediterranean and all the educated people in the Western part as well. The least educated Galilean spoke Greek fluently would speak Aramaic at home and on the street corner, and would at least understand the Old Testament readings in the synagogue. The uh, 
Pharisees and scribes uh, and Sadducees who were priestly cults spoke Hebrew at home. Scriptural Hebrew bore the same relationship to everyday Aramaic that Chaucerian English does to modern English. If you and I had heard church services in Chaucerian English every Sunday since we were children, you can bet we would understand it very well, especially if we had been obliged to study it in school the way the Jewish boys had to study Hebrew, even very poor ones. As an illustration of this, when St. Paul, who left Jerusalem to persecute the young Christian church, is converted to Christianity on the road to Damascus, and then wishes after five years to return to Jerusalem years later to visit Peter, his friends advise him strenuously not to return because the Jewish authorities would be furious with him for having changed his beliefs. He goes anyway, and sure enough, he is soon surrounded by a very angry crowd. St. Paul is saved only by a passing company of Roman soldiers, to whose captain he speaks Greek, asking for protection while he preaches to the crowd. The captain agrees, and Paul speaks to the riled up multitude in Hebrew. And St. Luke, who is writing this in his Acts of the Apostles, tells us the crowd was the more quiet because he was speaking in Hebrew, meaning they all understood him. Te ente hebreide dialecto, are the Greek words. His message is, by speaking Hebrew, pay attention to my words, because I'm an educated man, proficient in our most sacred language. There's yet another source of sacred information and material that is so-called channeled, appearing spontaneously in the minds of certain individuals who then dictate it or write it down. This phenomenon is scientifically recognized, along with automatic writing, um, by a person whose writing hand moves without conscious guidance from the brain. One of English literature's finest poems, Kubla Khan of Coleridge, is an example of complete unconscious composition. You remember in Zaladu that Kubla Khan, the stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. Pure music, absolutely incantatory and absolutely uncomposed by Coleridge. He was just aware that it was there. In spiritual lore, the so-called Seth material, S-E-T-H, is well known, and I personally am well acquainted with the Urantia book, U-R-A-N-T-I-A, -A, Urantia, a huge volume of over 2,000 pages. Its first two-thirds concerns the celestial government of various worlds by different orders of angels. Since I have very little direct experience with the angels, I go to the last third, which is a detailed account of Jesus' life and ministry, including all those years of his youth from age 12 to his baptism by John the Baptist. None of the Gospels have anything to say about these particular years of his life. There are apocryphal stories of his youth, although they're obviously simple-minded fables. Among the more serious speculations uh, that he may, uh, the, are that he may have studied in the Egyptian military mystery schools, uh, as Pythagoras did at the school of the Temple of Karnak. Even more adventurous speculation has him traveling to India to study with holy men there. The Urantia book, by contrast, has Jesus in his early ministry and before his uh, maturity and before his ministry, journeying all over the Mediterranean civilization as tutor to an Indian adolescent boy with a father of great wealth who came on a two-year tour with letters of introduction to everybody, including the Emperor Tiberius. The Emperor was said in modern times to illustrate perfectly Lord Acton's famous statement that power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. One delicious story about the audience the two Indians and Jesus had with Tiberius has the Emperor saying after his guests have left, no, if I had the magnificent bearing and gracious manner of that young Galilean, I would really be an emperor, wouldn't I? Well, if it's not true, it's a good idea. Needless to say, channeled material has not the slightest scholarly credibility. 
But the character and presence of Jesus is so familiar to us from the regular Gospels that it is delightful to be in his more extended company. And every historical detail in the Urantia book that I have been able to check out has turned out to be accurate. I have heard it said that there is no documentary evidence that Jesus of Nazareth ever existed. It could have been a complete myth. This is absolutely untrue and provable. Roman imperial records speak of him as a person, not just a movement, and Jewish records do also. Tacitus, or it might have been Livy, it's a long time since I read this material, uh, writes of him and also of his brother James, who is the first bishop of Jerusalem, and that was quite correct. Pliny the Younger, as an official of the empire, lofty enough so that his reports went not to another bureaucrat, but to Tiberius himself, wrote of Christ and his group very unfavorably and suggested they should be watched with great care. Josephus, the preeminent Jewish historian of the first century, describes Jesus' story exactly as you would expect a curious outsider would. He writes that Jesus was, quote, a miracle worker who taught the people and who was executed because he clashed with the Jewish authorities, unquote. Note that he doesn't blame the Roman authorities, even though it was they who actually executed Jesus. That situation has an amazing backstory to it and shows Josephus to be the smoothest talker in all antiquity. During the final military showdown with the Romans, um, armies which left the temple in Jerusalem utterly destroyed in 71 AD, Josephus was commanding a garrison in Galilee, besieged by the most prominent Roman general, whose name was Vespasian. Eventually food ran out and Josephus had to surrender. What he then had to expect in the normal course of events was either summary execution or to be given an oar to pull on in one of the Roman galleys for the next rest of a greatly shortened life. Instead of these possibilities, what he actually got was a private interview with Vespasian, during which what he had to say was exactly what Vespasian, what Vespasian wanted to hear, namely that the political situation in Rome was a complete mess that there had been three different incompetent emperors in the last two years, and that the time was ripe for Vespasian himself to step in with his armies, proclaim himself emperor, for which he was truly suited, and establish some competent administration for an otherwise healthy empire. Something of the sort may have been simmering in the back of Vespasius' brain, but Josephus's presentation is so powerful that it activated all of Vespasian's half-formed ambitions. He acted on them with complete success and made the fourth emperor in two years to sit on the imperial throne. He was made for the job. And believe it or not, he adopted Josephus into his own family, giving Josephus his family name of Flavius, so that thereafter he was known in the, Ang the uh, anglicized version as Josephus Flavius. The next year, with Vespasian staying in Rome as emperor, a large Roman army arrived in the Holy Land under the command of Vespasius, Vespasian's son, Titus, who after many years succeeded his father as emperor, and who in the meantime was determined to end the war definitively with the complete destruction of the temple and all of Jerusalem for that matter. Josephus, as Titus's guest during the campaign, was deeply grieved to see the devastation, but of course he had to keep his mouth shut. With the destruction completed, Josephus went to live in luxury with the imperial family in Rome for the rest of his life. He wrote 17 books of Jewish antiquities there in which he mentioned the Christian belief that Jesus was resurrected after three days in the tomb. He can't really have believed it himself because if he had, he would have had to change his entire life. The Jewish people acknowledge his significance as a major historian, but they really have never forgiven him going over to the enemy side as a pampered pet of the Roman court. 
But that looks a bit more attractive than summary execution or life as a galley slave, doesn't it? Let's take a look at the creation of the familiar four Gospels, because there are a few real surprises there, as illuminated by some folklore from the Urantia book. Mark's Gospel is located second in the series, but all scholars know it is the earliest, written in 68, the shortest and the simplest. Mark joined up with Jesus' followers as a late teenager. He came to know Jesus well, particularly after a long afternoon walk, just the two of them. But Mark was not present at most of the events he describes. He just came in at the end of Jesus' ministry. Mark became very close to Peter and later Paul later on. And most of Mark's information comes from Peter so that the gospel might really be called the Gospel of Peter and was written at Peter's request for the Christians in Rome. The final fifth of Mark's gospel was lost before it was copied. And a very short, lame ending was added to give some kind of finish to it. Scholars say the current ending was not, definitely not written by the same mind as wrote the rest. Scholars now make use of a technique called style criticism. Stilkritische for the Germans who invented it. They can establish a certain, certain pattern habits of an author and, of course, a characteristic vocabulary. If a given passage in a work shows different word patterns and a vocabulary different from the rest of the text, one can say with pretty good assurance that a different author wrote such and such a section of the text. Such is the case with the ending of Mark's gospel. The Gospel of Matthew has a different style, a different personality, and a different specific audience, Jewish Christians. Matthew, who used to be a tax collector, was a scholar of the Old Testament and was continually quoting it in his Gospel to demonstrate that substantially um, everything in Christ's ministry was foretold in the Old Testament. Usually he's on target. But sometimes the continual examples feel to me dragged in by the hair, but he is trying. The basis of the gospel was a set of notes uh, that Matthew wrote about Jesus' teachings just after the crucifixion and revised about 40 AD. Before going on a long preaching tour during which he was martyred, he gave the notes which were written, by the way, in Aramaic, to a disciple of his named Isidore of Antioch to transcribe into Greek and connect with narrative flow. To help him do this, he had the first four-fifths of Mark's gospel, remember the last fifth was lost, and an account of Jesus' ministry, now completely lost, probably written by the apostle Andrew, called by scholars Q for the German Quelle, meaning either spring of water or source as here. Luke's Gospel also had the four-fifths of Mark and Matthew and Q to help him out. Isidore of Antioch, who now had Mark's notes with him, I mean Matthew's notes with him, was caught in the siege of Jerusalem from 70 to 71 AD, but slipped through the siege lines at night and made his way to the village of Pella, where Jesus had often preached. In 71, in Pella, he completed, in Greek, the task Matthew had given him. Since the notes were Matthew's and the order to connect them came from Matthew, from him, Isidore called the result the Gospel of Matthew quite correctly, quite correctly. Luke's Gospel is again a different tone and quite a different audience, uh, the Gentile middle class. He himself was Greek, born in Asia Minor, in in uh, Antioch of Pisidia, a physician and frequent traveling companion of St. Paul's. He was not an eyewitness to the events he was writing about, but he had an almost modern approach to investigation and thorough techniques of interviewing witnesses who had been companions of Jesus. The Gospel was written in Achaia and mainland Greece in the year 82. He also wrote the Acts of the Apostles there, Although he planned to write a third book about Christianity, he died directly after finishing the Acts in 90 AD.
The fourth gospel, the gospel of John, is radically different from the first three, much more philosophical, theological, and mystical. John, who had been barely 20 when he joined Jesus, turned out to be the only disciple who died a natural death, all the rest were martyred, and at an incredible age of 101. John had been contemplating the truths he had learned from Jesus and living them intensely for years and years and years. No wonder his gospel is very different from all the rest. John did not actually write the gospel that bears his name, but he commanded it to be written and supplied the information for it from his memory with occasional help from the previous three gospels. The writer, actual writer, was a Hellenized Jew named Nathan of Caesarea. John saw that many incidents in Jesus' ministry had not found their way into the three other gospels, and he was determined to fill in the gaps himself. He had quite a number of disciples, and they extensively re-edited his gospel after his death. The modern scholars speak of two principal redactors, but there were lots of them. It is the most completely and thoughtfully profound of the four Gospels. Since the printing press was not invented until the 15th century, all the early copies of the Bible were done by hand, and accuracy of copying became immediately a major problem. <laughs> because 85 to 90% of the Roman Empire's population was illiterate. Even in Periclean Athens, literacy was not about 15%. And there were professional scribes on every street corner because they were very badly needed by everybody, of course. The Jewish people were highly literate, of course, but the early Gentile converts were mostly of lower social levels that were illiterate. All parishes desired to have their own copies of at least the Gospels and St. Paul's epistles which would then be read out loud to the worshipers on Sundays. So every parish asked its most literate parishioners to set aside time to copy sacred texts. That's a lot of time. Frequently, the copiers were only semi-literate, resulting in frequent misspellings and mistakes. For that reason, most of the earliest Bibles were horror stories of inaccuracy. The form of the text contributed greatly to this situation because the words had no spaces between them. This run-on format was called scriptuo continua and also omitted all accents and punctuation, such as we have now reading ancient Greek and Latin texts, making it very easy for a copyist to get lost. And if a copyist found he had left out a sentence and copied the sentence in the margins of the parchment, the next copyist might well assume that the marginalia were merely the last copyist's private commentary on the text and omit copying at all. Generation upon generation of accumulated copying errors were incorporated into new texts to the point where one had to wonder what was the original wording. How could one revere a text supposedly inspired by God when you couldn't even be positive of the uh, authentic wording? By the beginning of the fourth century, there were a good number of professional, educated Christian copyists turning out clear and accurate books, especially in Alexandria. Although by this time, of course, there were so many textual variants due to older miscopying that there was real doubt about the meaning of certain passages. And now a new problem arose precisely from the scholarship of these new copyists. They knew the Old Testament well enough to recognize that when the Gospel of Mark begins as follows, the second verse, as it is written in Isaiah, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. They realize that only the second sentence is Isaiah chapter 40. The first sentence is Malachi 3, 1. The learned copyists were embarrassed at Mark's lack of scholarship and therefore, change the text to read as it is written in the prophets instead of as it is written in Isaiah. Okay, attribution corrected, but now you falsified Mark's text. Sometimes the copyist would change the text to avoid giving potential intellectual ammunition to one of the many heresies prevalent before the Council of Nicaea settled on a creed that all Christians could believe. 
Saint Jerome in the early fifth century made his magnificent translation of the Greek gospels into Latin. But doing so, he loudly complained about the multiplicity of versions to choose between. Actually, he did a magnificent job because not only did he get the meanings very closely right, but also he got the tone of the gospel in Latin the same as the tone of the gospel in Greek. It was a time I was pretty familiar with the New Testament, both Greek and Latin. And I would read the lessons for the day, um, first in Latin, which was very easy, and then Greek, which I had had so much of. But what I could tell was that the simple, plain speaking, everyday man in the street tone of the uh, Latin translation in the Greek original was, was beautifully preserved in, in those two. Um, as we will discuss later on, King James Version of the Bible is a very, very different story. With the collapse of the Roman Empire and the death of classical culture, textual scholarship went into hibernation, of course, with the monks copying whatever er error-ridden text they could lay their hands on. But by the late 17th century, there are enough old texts available to compare to each other. That biblical scholarship revived little by little, mostly at first in England, then later emphatically in Germany, as old versions piled up to be compared and studied. Now we have nearly 7,000 texts from the early three or four centuries, including one partial text from the year 150, imagine. After 300 years of acrimonious disagreement, including schoolyard insults between scholars, we have now arrived at basic agreements about what the original wording was in most passages. For all their imperfections, these records have continued to inspire Christians for 2,000 years. I have one quarrel to pick with St. Jerome, and I'm really very proud of this one. You may recall in the Gospel of John, uh, on Easter Sunday, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and finds it empty, and she meets Jesus. And Jesus says to her in our versions that we're familiar with, do not touch me for I am not yet ascended to my father, go and tell the brethren what you've seen. Well, I thought to myself, that just can't be right. Um, St. Jerome to the contrary, and all his magnificent talent, it just can't be right because he says to doubting Thomas, put your hands in the wounds, and to another group of, of disciples in the Acts of the Apostles at a resurrection appearance, he says, handle me, see that I have flesh and bone the way a spirit hath not. In other words, I'm not a spook, I'm not an optical illusion, I'm not a ghost. I, have, I can manifest real physicality. Um, in one meeting, he says to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish and honeycomb. Did he need the food? Of course not. He was demonstrating that he could project a physical dimension, <clears throat> that he wasn't entirely up in heaven and just visiting them as a spook. Anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, the original text of John is me mu haptu, which St. Jerome mistranslates as do not touch me. What they really mean is don't keep clinging to me. I'm down here for a short time. We have work to do. Get the ball rolling, will you? Now, the Greeks have never had any doubt as to what that passage meant, that it meant don't keep holding on to me. Because for one thing, in Matthew's gospel, there are two or three women at the tomb, and when they meet Jesus, they hold on to his feet or his shins, the way you and I would if we were greeted with that tremendously emotional situation. However, of course, a whole body embrace between an adult Jewish man and woman who are not married would be unthinkable. But yes, grabbing the feet, grabbing the shins, that was possible. And that's what happens in Matthew's gospel. So that's really what's happening in John's gospel. I don't know what happened to St. Jerome. He just missed that one. But it resulted in several famous Renaissance paintings of Christ shooing Mary Magdalene away, saying, you know, do not touch me, noli me tangere, which literally means do be unwilling to touch me. So uh, you don't catch St. Jerome out very frequently. <laughs> The famous King James translation of the Bible into English, which is 
arguably the best translation of anything into anything, despite numerous errors. Uh, this bought Bible on which many of us were brought up demands special treatment. During the Middle Ages, Latin-speaking Western parts of Europe lost touch with the Greek-speaking Eastern part. The West knew only St. Jerome's early 5th century translation of the Greek Bible into Latin, a magisterial version reproducing not only the meaning, but as we have seen, the simple plain-speaking style of the Greek original. With the Italian Renaissance rediscovery of classical Greek literature, there arose a curiosity to know the original Greek Gospels. But there were very few available Greek texts to Erasmus in the 16th century when he decided to print the first Greek Bible in the West. He had available to him only one or two copies of any book in the Bible, and these were no older than the 12th century and all riddled with copying errors. His sole copy of Revelation was missing the last page altogether. All he could do was translate St. Jerome's Latin version of, the, of this page into his own best Greek. This is a very unfortunate situation. Although the fact that it was the only version obtainable in print gave it the title of, or the nickname of Textus Receptus, the approved text. This text was the basis for the King James English translation with all its errors. The English translators were sound scholars and chosen to come up with a version which would be acceptable to both the Catholic leaning scholars within the Church of England and the Protestant leaning ones. King James wanted to be sure the translation would not be used as a theological bludgeon on either side, and he was successful in this. And the translators, who'd begun the task deeply suspicious of each other, ended up the best of friends. What was anomalous, however, was the fact that the translation style was very much grander and more orotund and magnificent and poetic than the linguistically modern Greek and Latin. If you read the Greek original of that wonderful uh, passage, considering the lilies of the field, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you, not Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. That's just pure poetry. If you read the original Greek, it's flat as a pancake. <laughs> Absolutely, totally uninteresting. The great Professor Harold Bloom of Yale, who has read everything over, ever written five times and remembers it all, is so smart he thinks he knows everything. He wrote a book claiming that the character of Jesus as presented in the Gospels was so vastly different in the respective Gospels one from another that they could not be describing the same person. That is pure nonsense. There is no historical record of any sort of four closely allied spiritual leaders in early Christianity, and the four evangelists are fully attested to, each one with its strong personality in himself, with different life experience, different character, different temperament from his fellow evangelists, and perceiving different facets of Jesus' commanding personality from his own viewpoint. And each evangelist had an audience different from that of his fellow evangelists, as we have already seen. Professor Bloom shows a great mind out of its familiar literary world. In the spiritual world, he's really over his head. You might be curious to know if there were any of Jesus, any um, areas of Jesus' background in which he was critical of growing up. And here, of course, we are dependent wholly on folklore. The answer is a formative affirmative in four cases, although the Urantia book describes him as a loving and dutiful son in general. The first case dealt with the astonishing lack of sense of humor in Jewish life. How different today with so many famous Jewish comedians. <laughs> the English poet John Maysfield commented on the dumbfounding lack of humor in both the Old and the New Testaments. Over 1,600 pages and no one cracks a joke or even a smile. Are we that Amish? Further, one evening, his parents were instructing him in one of the fire and brimstone biblical passages, and Jesus spoke up and said, I know my earthly father loves me very much, 
and I can't believe my Heavenly Father loves me any less. That's the point. <laughs> the only time Jesus had trouble with the local rabbi, his teacher, was when he drew some attractive landscapes and then an astonishingly good portrait of his teacher. I don't know what paint medium he used or if this was just a charcoal drawing. A real scandal ensued because it was considered idolatrous to represent anything living in an artwork and most particularly not human beings. Jesus at first stood his ground, defending creativity and the creation of beauty uh, specifically, but eventually he allowed himself to be obedient to his horrified parents and rabbi, although he pretty plainly was not out inwardly convinced that art was evil. I'm with him. Um, the Jewish tradition persisted, however, even into the 19th century because of Israel's long history of idolatry, idolatry, not just Aaron's golden calf in the wilderness, but whole centuries of submission to images of Baal and several other pagan gods. Islam, of course, has exactly the same prohibition. The last area of disagreement with tradition came when Jesus and his father, Joseph, visited Scythopolis, one of the Greek cities of the Dicapolis, which presented a completely Hellenistic lifestyle. While they were there, some celebration was accompanied by athletic games, which they attended. Jesus wished Hebrew boys had something similar to these wholesome physical disciplines. Joseph saw nothing but vainglorious competition. What the book doesn't mention is that all Greek athletics were practiced in the nude, an automatic non-starter for any pious Jew. Let us take now a couple of ste steps back to get some historical perspective on the political background of Jesus' life. When Alexander the Great died in the early fourth century BC, on his deathbed, he left his empire, quote, to the strongest, unquote, knowing that his generals would fight among themselves for it no matter what he said. After a generation of bloodshed, boundaries firmed up, leaving Greece and Macedonia in the hands of Alexander's general for that region, Asia Minor under the symbol of Alexander General Seleucus, and Egypt under Alexander's general Ptolemy, one of whose descendants was, of course, Cleopatra. Ptolemy tried to conquer Israel and was defeated. Seleucus initially won the battle with Israel, but then lost the war by foolishly locating a statue of Zeus in the temple's Holy of Holies, provoking an epic outbreak of fury among the Jews who were led by Judas Maccabeus. Maccabeus was the nickname, had the hammer, and Judas well deserved it. Having definitively defeated Seleucus, Israel now enjoyed a couple of hundred years of self-rule, good for them. Eventually, rivals within the Maccabean family vied for the throne, and one of them, strengthened his argument by inviting in to press his case, the Roman army of Pompey the Great. The Romans came in and of course never left. From then on, Israel was a Roman colony with cardboard kings pretending to govern parts of it, while the military made all fundamental decisions. Governing the religious side were the Pharisees who were scribes and scholars and priests, the Sadducees who performed the animal sacrifices in the temple, and dominated the deliberative religious assembly, the Sanhedrin. They did not believe in an afterlife the way the Pharisees did. Society included these two groups and the Essenes, a severe monastic community in the desert, the Herodiads, supporters of King Herod Antipas of Galilee, and the troublesome zealots who believed in starting armed rebellions against Rome and ruled constantly. One of Jesus' brothers, Jude, was a zealot. They were perfectly aware they could not conquer the Roman armies with their endless supply of soldiers, but they assumed that if they got all Israel to join them in a fight to the death, God would be forced to intervene to save them. This idea was described to me by Robert Graves years ago as jogging God's elbow, a wonderful formulation. You might also say forcing God's hand a little less poetically. The point is that every one of these groups, except the Roman soldiers, were absolutely convinced that the Messiah would return to earth imminently. This is rarely known somehow. 
everyone was living in that tremendous rush of energy. And of course, they were all correct, although no one except Jesus knew how it was going to happen. The Old Testament prophets had so brainwashed the people with the idea of a Jewish Messiah, not necessarily divine, by the way, who would rule Israel and perhaps the whole world, that the people could not imagine his arrival without this political triumphalism. Now, I've mentioned the Pharisees who were priestly class. They were treated very severely by Jesus to the point where Pharisee today is synonymous with hypocrite. But they were actually the best people in town. They fulfilled their religious obligations. They worshiped regularly. They went through all of the minute ceremonial worship uh, practices that they had learned in Babylonia. And that was an interesting story in itself. The Jews were notoriously difficult to govern by any conquering nation. And so when the Achaeans, when the, the uh, Achaeans, no, when the Babylonians, the Chaldeans conquered them, um, they thought that the, the only way to govern them was to mix them in with the rest of the population so they would assimilate and their own racial identity would disappear. And so they took all of the fancy people of the Jewish state off to Babylon and assumed that they were just going to blend in with the multitudes and that would be the end of them. They'd cease to be troublesome. Well, what the Jewish people did was very interesting. They developed a whole lot of very distinctive ceremonial observations that were to be now traditional. Uh, I mention only the fact that lots of pious Jewish people to this day have bits of the scripture right near their door handle, so every time they go in and out of their front doors, they touch the scripture. It was that kind of thing. And the Pharisees were fanatical about that. That was the trouble. Yes, they were leading moral lives, and yes, they were being kind to their fellow citizens, but they were so stuck up about how observant they were that they couldn't go any further. And in Jesus' case, he said, it's the heart that matters not the pedophaging little observations in everyday life that you accomplish uh, quite right. So, in, and in the end, they were the ones who put him to death. So he had a real bone uh, to pick with them. Um, the point of those literal uh, uh, ceremonial observations is that the Jews came back from Babylon when, uh, when the Empress Cyrus the Great of, of uh, Persia freed them to do so. Uh, absolutely more united than ever and more different from their neighbors than ever. Oh, to give you an example, um, they were charitable to the poor. <laughs> but occasionally they would be about to make a charitable contribution. They would hire a trumpeter to come around with them. And he would tootle uh, fanfare and they would ostentatiously present the donation. And Christ said, if you make charitable contributions, do it in private, and you will be rewarded in private. I had a great uncle who uh, offered to pay for the entire repairs of the steeple of the old North Church in Boston when it blew over in a terrible storm. Remember the ride of Paul, midnight ride of Paul Revere and one it by land and two of us. Well, it blew over, and it was going to be very expensive to repair. And my great uncle, uncle said that he would shoulder the entire expense on one condition that they didn't tell who had done it. So they rebuilt the tower and then broadcast to the entire world the generosity of my great uncle. He never gave them another penny. <laughs> there are consequences for not treating people seriously. But uh, it's important to realize that the Pharisees actually lived so much better lives than most of the peoples around, him, around them that they were many groups of Hellenes, I don't say they're all Greeks, but they're part of the Hellenistic world, that observed that the Jews simply lived better lives than their neighbors. And many of them who could afford it uh, hung around um, Israel and observed to learn what a good life was really like when it was lived properly. Jesus apparently had about 30 Hellenes following him around throughout his ministry. Uh, they had the sense that everybody else had that something big was about to happen. But more than that, here was a chance to observe their Jewish neighbors who lived better lives than they did. So 
when you read about the Pharisees, you have to temper the fact that they were really trying to do a good job. In 26 AD, the year of Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, Pontius Pilate arrived with his wife, Claudia, to take command of the Roman troops in Jerusalem. His was a second-rate, shabby post trying to govern a bitterly rebellious and contentious population, which made nothing but trouble, particularly regarding their religion. Pilate put his foot spectacularly wrong right away. His troops marched in, holding banners with the face of the Emperor Tiberius on them. And the Jewish religion, as you know, uh, uh, was, was horrified at that because all depictions of human beings were considered idolatrous. Pilate refused to remove them and was then informed that the authorities would remain at the bottom of the steps leading to his palace until the offending pictures were removed from the banners. He said to them, I could have you all killed. And they said the, the equivalent of, go ahead. Pilate didn't believe in any religion, even the Roman, and couldn't understand how anyone could die for religious beliefs. Now, it's important to emphasize that this was not an unusual condition. The fact is that most people in the empire did not have religious beliefs. The Greco-Roman religion of Zeus and Hera and Hephaestus and all those people, which was descended from the Sumerian gods, by the way, was not believed by substantially anybody in Greece or Rome after, let us say, the Battle of Sal Salamis, decisive victory over the Persians. And since people have to have some reason for understanding the world and some method of doing it, the lower classes, who were not intellectually acute, went back to the mystery religions, which were, as Toynbee correctly surmised, the surviving religion of the universal religion of the Cretan Minoan empire. That's what these mystery religions, which involved blood sacrifices and a purported death to this life and rebirth in, in holy circles, uh, all of them. And sometimes this was accompanied by hallucinogenic mushrooms. I said to Robert Graves, but we know the ingredients in the mushrooms and they're all very harmless. And he said, yes, but it's M-U-K-O-S, mucos, that's the word for mushroom. You just take the first letter of each of those words. So I hadn't realized that. Robert had an incredible classical education. But my point is that the upper classes, who mostly did not turn back to the mystery religions, although in the second century AD, the um, emperor Hadrian was an initiate of some of the mysteries. But mostly the upper classes turned to philosophy. So that's why you have at a given moment in classical Greece, the fifth and fourth centuries, suddenly a whole lot of wandering uh, Stoics and, and uh, other kinds of philosophers because people had to have some rationale for living and they didn't have one. Their, their uh, religion of Zeus and Hero was just too stupid to be relieved, believed. I had at Harvard a professor of history religi of religions and he was the world expert in Greco-Roman religion. And he said to us that it was the most stupid religion ever believed by an advanced people. No wonder they had to turn from it and try to get answers from philosophy that their religion was not providing for them. That said, you, there were plenty of shrines to these old gods and you paid lip service to them, but nobody really believed them. It was just a way of paying respect to the spiritual world. If you read Hadrian's memoirs, he's going around creating temples and priesthoods to worship this and that figure, hoping to meet the divine and never finding it. Um, here we're back to Pilate, stuck with the uh, religious rulers at the bottom of the flight of stairs leading to his palace and not budging. He, um, after several hours, Pilate suddenly, sullenly, ordered the uh, pictures removed. He tried to regain face in a few days by putting the face of Tiberius on shields placed around Herod Antipas's palace. Again, the Jewish authorities protested furiously, but Pilate wouldn't budge this time. So the authorities went over his head, writing directly to Tiberius, whose reply told Pilate, for heaven's sake, develop a little sensitivity to local conditions. 
Pilate was naturally deeply humiliated. He never forgot it. The folklore publishes a letter purportedly from Pilate, Pilate to Tiberius, partly concerning Pilate's brief conversations with Jesus, pleasant ones, in which Pilate says he warns Jesus not to go too far in his criticism of the Jewish authorities because Pilate would not be able to protect him if things really got out of hand. He writes that Jesus is fine looking with, quote, hair the color of new wine, unquote. What on earth is that? Would that be an auburn color or would it be white wine, a yellow color? I can't tell. One would expect dark hair at that part of the Mediterranean. Then Pilate gets down to the real point of the letter. He's in need of more troops. He has only 100 and has written to his provincial superior, the legatus in Syria. But he too says he's shorthanded. A huge mob would be uncontrollable with just 100 troops. The significance of all of this is that in the coming trial of Jesus, Pilate will be playing a weak hand trying to save Jesus from crucifixion. The ecclesiastical trial by the Sanhedrin eliminated all of Jesus' friends like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea from the deliberations. Therefore, they had nothing left in the Sanhedrin but his enemies. Jesus was found guilty of blasphemy and therefore worthy of death because he claimed equality with God. But the Jews were forbidden for ex from executing people whom they had condemned themselves. That had to be done by the Roman authorities. In Pilate's public uh, trial of him, in Greek, by the way, the Jewish leaders always spoke with Pilate in Greek, calling him hegemon, ruler. Pilate said that was not an acceptable, executable crime under Roman law. Then the Jewish leaders changed their whole story, claiming Jesus invited political rebellion, a very grave offense to Rome. A third of the Sanhedrin was gravely offended because they had not tried Jesus on this charge, and they disappeared from the public square. Pilate privately asked Jesus about this. Did he say that he was the king of the Jews? He said, yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate believed him and told the crowd he found the charge had no validity whatever. Now, this is the crucial point in the story. What most people don't know is that Pilate had recently been censured by Tiberius yet again. And one more serious error would probably cost him his post. The Jewish authorities knew all about it and played their trump card. Quote, if you do not execute this man, you are no friend of Caesar's, unquote. That did it. Pilate caved. With all the rebellions by the zealots, it's amazing to me that Pilate lasted another 10 years in the post. Eventually, he was fired by his regional boss, the legatus of Syria, and sent home to Rome to explain himself to Tiberius, now a great age. While Pontius and Claudia, Claudia, Latins pronounce it, were sailing to Rome, Tiberius died, and Pontius faced a new emperor, Caligula. Uh-oh. Caligula told him he'd botched the job in Israel, that there would be no further post for him, and that he was being retired in disgrace. He and Claudia settled in what they called Helvetia, which we call Switzerland, specifically Lausanne. Folklore says Pontius brooded over the trial of Jesus forever. What is definitely known historically is that he committed his suicide. I don't know exactly when this happened. Claudia then publicly identified herself as a Christian convert. She had, hadn't dared as long as Pontius was alive. The agent of her conversion was her longtime maid, a very early convert who appears in John's Gospel, bearing a letter from Claudia to Pontius in the middle of Jesus' second private session with him. The letter warned him not to do anything bad to, quote, this good man, unquote and told him she had had nightmares concerning Jesus the previous night. Now, I'd like to end on a what if, which is always beside the point because it didn't happen that way. But all the way through Jesus' ministry, he was being pestered by the claim that he was inciting the kind of, peop of, of rebellion that the people wanted to provoke the Messiah's coming. Mm -hmm.
And the question was, did he pay taxes? Well, it turns out he did. And the taxes to Rome were, if properly collected and not gouged, 10% of your income, and another couple of percent went for the management of the temple. It turns out that his, he and his followers paid the taxes to the temple and also to the, authority, the taxes to Rome and also to the temple. So um, there's a spot in the Gospel of John after Christ Christ's most spectacular miracle, if you don't count the raising of Lazarus, which of course I do, is next most spectacular miracle, it was the feeding of the 5,000. That was a sensational thing to have done and was reported far and wide. And the result of it was that um, the three initial gospels say that after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus went up to the hills to pray, which is where he, which he did frequently. John's gospel gives you a much more complete story. He was getting away from voices in the crowd that were saying, as quoted by John, this is the man we were looking for. And they tried to lay violent hands on him and force him to be king. Well, of course, that wasn't going to be, and he evaded them. If you couple this, with the fact that he was able to persuade Pilate during his trial, that he had no political ambitions whatsoever, nothing to worry the, the Roman government at all, you're left to muse that if the Jewish people had accept Christ, accepted Christ as their Messiah, there would have been no destruction of the temple. There would have been no diaspora, the throwing the Jews out into the outside world, away from Jerusalem, so that there would be no sufficient concentration of them to cause any further problems for the Roman army. That was what that was all about. It wasn't just punishment. It was to make sure they couldn't muster a quorum to get anything deleterious accomplished. That, that uh, life would have been very different. But of course, it happened the way it had to happen. Now, there are several other interesting talk, topics I could talk about, but I want to leave time for question and answer and perhaps some talk about the mass. Is that agreeable to everyone? The point of the Mass is that there is only one intellectually viable solution to the ministry of Christ. And that is that he is one person with two different natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And the reason for this is very sound intellectually. If he were merely a human being, his, his uh, story would be pitiable and inspiring, but it couldn't accomplish anything of universal value because there was no universal dimension in that picture. It was all just one solitary human individual. But then, if he was simply God and not human at all, how could he reach down and subordinate his human will to God's will, which is the whole point of the exercise? He couldn't. It would have no um, universal content to it. So you had to have both the human and the divine, and it had to be only one person. Although the, the Trinity is supposed to love, the three members of the Trinity love each other, and yet it is one substance and one matter of which they are made. That is the root. And um, in the 300 years between Christ's ministry and the Council of Nicaea, which formulated the creed, because the Emperor Constantine needed it. Uh, that's an interesting story in and of itself. Um, Constantine was smart enough to realize he needed the, the religion of Christianity to hold his empire together. But the trouble with that was that they had many different ideas of what the truth was. And there had been no definitive settling of what Christians really believed. And they had tried any number of all possible intellectual mistakes that could be made about the nature of Christ were made. And there were some people who believed that particular version of Christianity. And Constantine saw very clearly that he wasn't going to be able to use Christianity as a kind of social glue unless the Christians believed in the same thing. They had the same beliefs. And that required a creed. And the creed is most detailed and most specific about the nature of Christ, which was what was most needed by everybody involved. Um, 
Theological disagreements are always extremely bitter. Uh, when Bishop Arius got up to speak at the Council of Nicaea, the first thing that happened to him was he got punched in the nose. That doesn't seem a very decorous kind of comportment for a major religious council. But tempers were running really, really high. Um, the uh, one reason why they had not created a creed up until that time was that, as I've said, the Old Testament prophets brainwashed the Jewish people to think of a glorious military conquering hero as the Messiah. Um, and they couldn't imagine that this wouldn't, that Christ could come without this political dimension being added to it. And when it wasn't, the assumption was that, oh, next Thursday, promptly at 9 o'clock, the second coming will happen. And so, obviously, you are not going to worry about what happens in between except to try to leave, lead a good life. So people were waiting, waiting, waiting. Now, what did Christ say about this? This is interesting because this is the only facet of his mission that he did not know about. Christ was said to empty himself, the process is called kenosis, after kenos in Greek meaning empty, of many of his powers when he came down to earth in human form. They were put on the back burner. For example, he couldn't be omnipresent in human form. He couldn't be omniscient in human form. So he had to empty himself of these things and, and work with a certain amount of, of unknowingness. And what he said about the second coming, which he described in great detail, was this. But the hour of, its, of my coming, no one knows, not the, even the angels in heaven. Only my father knows. So he was very specific in not promising them an immediate arrival. But they, when, especially when the temple was destroyed in 71 AD, they couldn't imagine that God would permit that to stand. He had to be coming now. So people were always waiting next, next the way uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses today think that the end is near. And they point out various meteorological disasters and political disasters which would ensure, well, as the ladies not for burning, Christopher Fry has one of the characters say, one of the clergymen say, oh, I don't think the second coming is imminent. We've got a lot of backsliding to do before that. <laughs> But the, the timing of the second coming was an important reason for delaying um, certain matters which would otherwise have been attended to. Uh, any other questions? Okay. One question. Yes. One question. Yes. And that turned out to be quite true. Uh, four years, you say 30 AD, and 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. There was no prophecy, prophecy, the Malachi, the time way back, that low you on. Yes. And you had the whole diversity. So as far as you were saying, basically, you studied his knowledge. And people were going about the business now, we were allowed to the first time. And they came back to that low. There's another, there's another very, very um, fascinating, intellectually fascinating possibility here. And that is what is called process theology. And I haven't met that in many places, but what I have, it boils down to this. Many people have the idea that God created the heavens and the earth. On the seventh day, he rested, sat back on a pillow and turned on the celestial TV. <laughs> the fact is that God is continually creating. Everything is continually changing. And man from the middle, middle ages was thought by many scholars to be enlisted by God into the process of, of uh, perfection of the universe. That God uh, wanted man as a admittedly fallible, finite, humble helper in the perfection of the universe. Uh, which means something logically very fascinating about that. Namely, that if man is to be God's helper in the, in the perfection of the universe, which I thoroughly believe, 
then man has a certain control about when and how it happens. He can hold progress back if he wants. And if God is allowing him to do that, maybe it's up to man to set the tipping point for the second coming. And that was why it had not been decided at that moment and would be decided later on. That's possible. It's called process theology. I think it's great fun to, cha- to, to yes. Well, there are many people who have calculated from events in the Old Testament based on Daniel's prophecy when the world is coming to an end. Unfortunately, they don't seem to have worked out. Uh, You can always say, well, it says it will happen uh, 17 years from the time where you see the profanation of the Holy of Holies. None of that has, has, uh, has worked out. I like the idea of man being given a say in what happens and uh, observe that we all pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, indicating it isn't being done on earth. Uh, what is perfect is, this, is the rhythm and direction of perfection which we're heading toward. Um, it, because that is perfection because we are programmed. That's enlightenment is thought. It's not that everything is perfect on earth right now. The process is perfect because it's leading us to perfection. I like that idea very much indeed. Yes. There are questions there. Is the Nicene Creed what we consider the uh, basis? Yes, and there's, a, there's a, an Apostles' Creed also, which is slightly different but does not contradict it in any way, whatever. Okay, so that's what we would consider the modern creed of the Catholic Church today? Absolutely, and the Protestant churches as well. Okay, and uh, my other question was, is there any, we're obviously working on on Beethoven's Mass, the setting of, uh, of this creed. Is there anything that you would like to say in terms of how how he has uh, uh, taken that creed and put it into music. Is there anything in terms of emphasis or anything in particular that is relevant for us to consider in terms of our performance of the Mass? No, there's there's no eccentric feature of the Beethoven Mass, whatever. It is uh, extremely conventional, and the fundamental quality that I would find in it would be a wonderful spaciousness and breadth to the text because he doesn't involve in any virtuals or tricks of textual setting at all. It's very straightforward, Um, but it is obviously great music and there's a sense of almost limitless expandability in that mass, which I think is its crowning glory. Could you say something about um, Mozart's fascination with Titus? With? Uh, with Titus. Titus. Tito, specifically. Uh, well, it's an overture which I have conducted several times with great delight. But the work was a very forced composition. It was written in two weeks. And it, the recitatives are not by Mozart at all. They're by his pupil, Franz Xavier Zussmeier. Uh, Mozart wept at the premiere. He was so unhappy with the work. There are three or four wonderful parts to it, and they were mostly composed before that fatal pressure cooker, two weeks. Um, it is an old-fashioned libretto of an opera seria, uh, not of the sort that Mozart wished to set. He'd gone quite beyond that. And um, aside from the splendid overture and a few good arias, many of them accompanied by basset horn, Um, The work has never found favor with the public. Julius Rudell, when he returned to Vienna after many years successfully conducting the New York City Opera, uh, thought he was going to show the Viennese a masterpiece they had neglected. And in fact, the production failed. And a friend of mine who sold something 
in, in the Metropolitan Opera told me that he was there, of course, for all performances. And he said, there was never a performance of La Clemenza de Tito, which was presented in two acts, in which the public did not leave at the end of the first act and never return. And to my mind, it's a very sad piece to listen to because apart from those three or four really lovely pieces composed beforehand, what it, it, the, or, the late orchestration is wonderful. The style is nobody but Mozart. But it, to me, it is extremely disheartening because the score tells me what Mozart would have sounded like if he had not been a genius. And that is a horrible thing to hear. Never been a success. However, I take that back. After Mozart's death, Constanza toured with it. And she did have a success. My own feeling is that, <coughs> as an old-fashioned opera seria, it probably needs a lot more ornamentation than Mozart's later operas needed. And uh, Constanza wouldn't have known enough to put that in. And the modern people do not. But it's a, to my mind, it's a very sad one. If it sounded like anybody but Mozart, <laughs> but it, he's, he's unmistakable, but shorn of his, of his magnificent beauty. The, the thing about tax, the tax situation, <clears throat> which is so bitterly resented, the, the Jewish people would have, would have um, been annoyed by any tax that the Romans levied. But remember, the Romans were producing good water, public health, freedom from piracy, and a whole lot of other things which were desirable for commercial life. But the, but the reason why the tax collectors had such a bad name was that in many parts of the empire, you had what was called tax farming, uh, whereas uh, legitimately, the Romans were only supposed to ask 10%. The fact is that taxes were often collect collected by companies formed for the purpose who then bid for the job. And of course, if you bid for uh, the, the low bid, I mean the high bid won, then you, you settled in under the protection of the Roman authorities and gouged the citizens uh, out of much more money than just the 10% that Rome wanted, because this was a tax farm situation, and the highest bidder won the opportunity to harass people by collecting more taxes than, than was owed to Rome. That was the basis of the extreme bitterness. Sorry, I, had, uh, two, I want to ask one other thing. Because you said that um, the question of Christ being man and being God, God. And spiritual, gave it a certain universality, but it seems to me there is a universality in that act. For example, I think perhaps the most challenging act of Christ for us is the question of Gethsemane, his decision finally to drink from the cup, knowing what was going to befall him. The supreme example of subordinating his will to that of the Father. Yes. Well, that's what his mission was all about. Yes, and I think, for example, Schiller takes that up in this essay on the sublime and the question of where he says that the only thing it seems that every human being must, human beings have free will, but the only thing that no one can escape is that we will all die. So how is it, how do you resolve this seeming paradox that you have to face death um, but a decision that the manner of death or really manner of life becomes your own act because it's clear that with certain people like Joan of Arc, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, 
you know, other people. The great heroes. Yes, that, and this Mother Teresa, someone says, that this, in a sense, um, became a, a touchstone for their, their own actions. And although they were not God in the way perhaps that Christ was, there is a certain definite universality when an individual decides to drink from that cup. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on this. And also, um, I, in, for example, St. Matthew's Passion, clearly this is very present. Uh, what other works of music is it really explicit? Yes, in, in both the Passions, and by the way, there, are, there were two other Passions that got lost. Yeah. We've got about half. I used to think it was a third, but it's only a half. Uh, two thirds. It's only a half of Bach's production. In the end, it were those chorales. Bach is cradling in his arms the dead savior. It's unbelievably moving. I remember attending a, a wonderful performance of the Philharmonic under Mazur, with that superb uh, choir from the Thomas Kirche in Leipzig best choir I ever heard. <clears throat> and I was picking up my coat at the end of the performance and we all had start in our, stars in our eyes. Our feet really weren't touching the ground at all. We were just so inspired. And an elderly couple, look who's talking about elderly people, behind me said, the wife said to the husband, what did we hear this evening? And I couldn't resist. I turned around and said, not much, just the complete revalidation of Western Christian civilization. <laughs> and they laughed and they said, you're absolutely right, that's why we're so excited. <laughs> I mean, that really went deep, as deep as you can go. One interesting idea is that beauty and nobility depicted tend to inspire emulation but nobody forces you to be good. You can go, listen all the way through the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, as Hitler did every birthday that he had. He insisted on having the Ninth Symphony played to him. Um, you can listen all the way through the, 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 the Ninth Symphony and not realize what it is you're listening to, or you do realize that you don't act on it. We are not dragooned into being good by the arts, but they are very healthy to have around. Yes. You said something that I just thought of last week that I would like to do. Um, and maybe it's another lecture that you have to give, but when you were talking about with the Jews that accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the whole dysphoria that occurred, and things would have been so different for them. It's just, as you're talking, I'm, trying, I'm being in the moment as I'm listening to your this incredible lecture time. It's just so wonderful to hear what you're saying. But there's a part of mine that wants to have a whole other conversation. What do you think, what, why do you think the Jews felt he could be the Messiah? Was it because they felt that they had a connection to God and didn't need to mediate? And then they thought that Christians always believe that the clergy needed to have this connection? I'm sorry, I'm not catching what you're saying here. Well, I'm curious to know, you, you said something that I thought was so profound. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. You, you said something that to me was so profound, is that, is that, um, that you said that the Jews had accepted Jesus Christ, things would have been so different for them. They wouldn't have been in this, this dysphoria, they would have got to stay, they wouldn't have been traveling all over the world, always running, you know. And, and I'm thinking, but well, why did they not accept Jesus as the Messiah? I mean, I was just with Pat today saying, probably what's going to happen is. Well, one, ha one has to say that the atonement which Christ came to earth to accomplish was fated. I myself think that in life there are certain things that you can change because you have free will, and I think there are other things that are simply going to be there no matter what. And this was some, this is a work that needed to be done, and God's purposes played out the way they were supposed to. It was just very painful for, for Jesus, but that was, I would say, fated to happen, and thank God it did happen. Um, I think it's useful to keep in mind that uh, how important Schiller's 
has to say emission analysis is, is misdescribed because, of course, in connection with the uh, his portrayal of Moses as this Egyptian prince who rebelled yes. against the hierarchy and then uh, in the not only gave the Ten Commandments, but it is in the Old Testament, which admittedly was assembled by tradition and then corruption long, long, long after Moses is no longer around. When you're talking about Moses, you're talking about 1,200 years before these events that you're talking about. Yes. And during this period of time, the entire Mediterranean is just a complete showdown between different imperial systems. Yes. Which, are, which, which reject the fundamental idea that ends up in the book of Genesis, which is that we're creating the living image of God and that we're here to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and to establish man's dominion, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which is the idea of the little creator. But that is not upheld by any of these imperial, any of these imperial systems except classical Greece, which was really itself, which is this Egyptian heritage. I'm just going through this because right now, scholars in, in um, China intend to meet with people from Greece and from other ancient civilizations to actually discuss what more can be known about this because it is an increasing interest in the fact that in the middle of this span of 1,200 years, Confucius emerges in China. And so there's a process going on of a of a resistance against this imperial mentality which somehow treats people like animals, which the all the imperial yes. systems. Well one has to realize that the Bible is a picture of an evolving, improving, more sensitive um, religion that somebody wrote a book called The Biography of God. <laughs> and it had to do with the biography of human perception of God and how it became more sensitive and more accurate. Uh, in the old days, the Lord God was a God of war and thunder who rumbled around the top of Mount Sinai and was um, there to help you out in battle. Um, and after all, when the Jewish religion began under Abraham, it was not monotheistic. It was henotheistic, meaning there are many gods, but I'm going to worship just one. And so um, Abraham worshiped just one god, thinking there were probably many. By the time you get to Moses, all the rest of them are, are a snare and a delusion. There's only one. That's real monotheism. And so you see that there's a tremendous progression in understanding back there. I always have the idea that the leaders of the, well, before they went to the Babylonian captivity, they're properly historically called Hebrews. And when they came back in the sixth century after that, it was 38 years abroad, they were called Jews. That's the usual practice. But I have the impression that, that the, the people who were the leaders who were close to God were so close to him, they could even haggle with him. But suppose there were 50 righteous people in Nineveh, would you destroy it? Well, maybe if those, supposedly there were 40, and so on down the line. It's wonderful how it's like a, a couple of rogue salesmen. Um, absolutely amazing. And you know that he knows their first names. As far as the rest of the people are concerned, they're just a bunch of people over there called the, the, the Jewish people. In the, in the New Testament, God knows everybody's first name. <laughs> but we, we could write the biography of our understanding of God, and it would be quite a long journey. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>